Um, all right, guys, good morning. Welcome to LLPX02, the second installation of our um, unconference, mini conference, ludic conference, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's great to have everybody here. Uh, let me tell you what's coming up today. So, if you haven't seen it already, the schedule for today, let me just flip over to there. Okay. The schedule for today is that I'm going to welcome everybody until five minutes past. So I've got two more minutes to welcome everybody. Wait, I've got a follower apparently. I just heard the little jingle. Thanks for the follow. <laughs> <laughs> subscribe, with, subscribe with Prime. It's free. Uh, so, what Prime. was I going to say? Um, yeah, there's going to be a keynote in a few minutes. Uh, our keynote this morning is from um, Rose Bard and Anton Vigel? Vigel? How do you pronounce your surname? Vigel. Vigel. Um, Anton has helped me with the preparation of this conference, so he's considered a, a kind of co-chair of the conference this, this time. And Rose has been involved with LLP for a long time, and even before LLP existed. Um, following the two talks, we're going to do a about a 45-minute Meet Your LLP2P i.e. meet your, your we're going to have little groups we're going to move into the rooms down below on um discord here you can see there's room one to seven uh we'll go to those rooms and just introduce our our language our ludic our pedagogy introduce our context and you know do a little bit of networking uh, at 10 15 uh, is when the ingredients talks will start and the ingredients talks are essentially each person will talk about an ingredient, a, a ludic element, a language element, or a pedagogy element. And then we'll use those elements in the second day to create a kind of workshop or a lesson plan or a curriculum even. So yeah, that's the plan for today. So without further ado, the time is uh, 9.05. Uh, I'm gonna ask Rose and uh, Anton to introduce what does LLP mean to you? And we'll start with Rose and feel free to share your screen, Rose. Hello guys. <laughs> so uh, Rose here, right? Um, let me just uh, get my could you, could you share it for me? Actually, yeah, sure. I don't have it, uh, the board. Oh, okay. I have the game board. Right okay. Now. But if you want to share for me my no, no. page, that would be cool. I'll, I'll let you do it. Could you do could... it for me? Oh, you want me to? Yeah, yeah, sure. It's on Thanks. the game, it's on the game board, had... right? Yeah. 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 Game board. Yeah. Okay. So basically, I'm, um, I'm in Brazil, right? Um. And um, I've been um, sort of um, in this journey with games and uh, for a long time, uh, kind of more like trying things out in my own practice. Um, and that's when I was um, on Twitter, you know, um, kind of like looking for more people. Then I I met Mark, who actually introduced me to uh, James and, and Jonathan, the LLP. I didn't know actually that was James and Jonathan behind LLP, and that's the kind of funny thing, because uh, I knew Jonathan Dehan, right, like from a book. I, I bought his book like in 2015, and James because of Minecraft, you know, so both of them is... Uh, were a big influence and then it was kind of like really amazing to to you know like oh come to this community my way mark jones introduced me and said come to this community you know it's like these people that really looking uh, to do similar things that you've been doing and i'm like uh oh, okay so he he sent me a little link and here i am and ever since I joined the LOP, uh, it made a big difference for me, you know, really like a huge impact. Because up to that moment, it was more about like learning through games, but game-based learning really didn't really do it for me. 
it's kind of like there was something missing in the mixture, you know. Um, so uh, basically, at that point, I was kind of like testing things out, trying to bring games, mostly analogical games. Uh, and uh, that was also when um, I, I got like Minecraft, into Minecraft, you know. So I think that my ludic, you know, mostly is Minecraft at the moment. Um, in the last few years, I've been like really devoting in creating uh, lesson plans and working with the students with Minecraft. And I'm specialized in literacy as well, but I work mainly in the last 20 years with English language teaching. So, um, yeah, and I've been working with project-based learning, so testing out like project-based learning I kind of moved, you know, from just applying games and learning, um, letting the game run itself to actually working more towards uh, creating lessons, um, thinking about what we do, you know. So that's when LOP became really uh, something that helped me uh, see through a structure, you know, like to think of what is the Ludzki, um application right what i'm using and uh, for what purpose and what way i'm going to implement that so if i if i actually um share you know i i thought about like some of the things when when james asked me what does lop mean to you you know um you know, different from game-based learning. What, what, why makes it so different for you? Can you explain it to me? And then I came up with these, uh, these or that kind of uh, uh, poster to explain that. Okay, in GPL, game matters, right? Like it, it's always the focus on the game, and I, I thought like it's it can't be the game only, right? Like we as teachers, we matter. And learners matters too, like what they do with the game, how they use the game for the learning and how we mediate this program. So that's one of the most important uh, aspects for me when I look into GBL and LLP, you know, is it change the, the focus from us, the people, away uh, from the game. The game becomes the instrument, right? It's a tool but it's not the focus. And we focus on how the learning is going to happen, right? Like how we actually create the conditions for this learning. So we're talking about pedagogy here, right? And uh, the game is all always about like learning, learning through the game, but okay, but how? How do we learn through the game? And it differs, it depends on each game, right? Like how you implement it. Each one needs a different side of pedagogy, just like if you use a video, if you use a book, if you use an article, um, you know, any kind of a tool, resource that you bring to your class as a media, you, you need to develop a specific pedagogy to work, in, um, to, to get the learning happening, right? And um, so, Instead of like, what can the game do for us? It's one thing that I learned from Jamie and Jonathan is what can we do with this game? So ever since I, I met this community and I've been like following you guys and you know, everything that you guys sharing, it has been like a huge inspiration to help me to think, okay, so if I'm going to choose this game or, you know, whatever I'm, I'm going to use, what do I do with this, right? What does it uh, I need to do or my students need to do to promote learning here? So the key, um, the, the, the key phrase for me is learning. It's like the game's job, right? With the GBL, it's like 
like the the game is going to do the magic like there is a magic there in that game um and i i strongly believe that uh, learning of course between interaction between people right uh, language learning it's not just with the interaction with things the object like uh, you know but really through people or how you interact and the, the role of the teacher here is really the mediation role but sometimes other students when they um you know that kind of like when the other student can function also as a mediator of the process for the other student. So it's, you know, still it's about people. So learning for me is, of course, when creating, we create opportunities, we create the conditions for the interaction. And I really believe that it's something that needs to be facilitated. It's not like magic. Um, games are good for some you know, some aspect, I play games and I've been trying to play games in other languages, the language that I'm learning, but, you know, without someone to really like being there and interact with me and help me out, you know, sort things out or uh, kind of like motivate me to speak, that kind of thing, it still a need. The game, it becomes like an input source, but if it's way above your level, it's daunting, it's overwhelming, it's tiring, it's so challenging, but it's fun. If you have that challenge with someone, you know, to play together, someone who actually, it's a more um, uh, like, you know, proficient, someone to actually share that language and help you out with that. So yeah, that's what LLP means to me. And um, it has really, I'm so grateful, you know, for this community. And thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, James and Jonathan, for putting this together. It's really been amazing. Thank you. Thanks, Rose. We have a couple of minutes for questions or comments or anything like that. So go for it. Rose, okay. If, does anyone have any questions? The <laughs> game comment you made. Um, Your mic's a little bit quiet, Anton. Oh, yeah. Really? See if I can turn you up. There you go. I really liked your magic in the game comment. Uh, I often see games as really well-designed systems that we can interact in, like untapped potential sometimes. I really see it as that. I just, that was a cool comment, magic in the game. <laughs> But it doesn't happen by itself, right? Like mm. just magic. It's like traveling to it's like traveling to another country. I've been I lived one year in Egypt. I lived four years in England. Mm. You know. And nowadays that we can immerse in any language through the internet. And I've tried like a server totally in Chinese. Mm. And seriously, it was I mean, Minecraft for instance, it's it's a game that is like very low in terms of language, but it's still, when I got into the lab, there were like all these, you know, because you get into a server, you need to know what is expected of you there. And seriously, I couldn't cope with it. Mm. Even though I was like studying for two years, I mean, my third year of Chinese, but like all those characters, you know, so difficult. So. Um, I wish there were someone patient enough, you know, to like take the lead with me. And I had this other experience with my friend's daughter who is, he spoke Chinese. Um, and I tried to play with her. She was 14 and seriously, she wouldn't speak in, in Chinese with me. You know, she wouldn't be patient enough to try it out. And that was, I remember one time uh, I got something in my inventory and she's like, oh, uh, you got my stuff, give it to me in English, you know, as she spoke in English as well. And then I said, well, if you speak in Chinese, I will give you. And she ran a, uh, after me, it's like, gay war, gay war, you know, and I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, finally. <laughs> <laughs> it's just something in Chinese, you know. Blackmailed and into was, speaking was, Chinese. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so I told her, I'm like, oh, it's it's a cool, cool idea for us to practice, but 
you know, she she really don't have the motivation and patience. To, she's 14, right? She's mm. not expected. We teachers, we have that. But, so, but I wish I had someone to actually interact with. I w that would be fun. Martin, you have a question. Oh yeah, Rose. Thank you very much for the for the talk. Uh, I really liked the point you make about um, you know teachers being a major part of the process. It's not just a game. To, here, here's a game, and then you you step back. You're out of it. Mm -hmm. But I think, um, like I teach really little kids, so uh, I think games are really important. As it's like a bridge between me and the students. The game I can use the game to bring to create an atmosphere in the class so that I can connect with the students. And even after the game, there's all these other opportunities for for a kind of learning. Like we can talk about, we can reflect on the game, or the students can, uh, you know, ed alter the game or make a new game kind of based off of it. Even after that first game is totally finished and gone. Thank you. Absolutely, I had the experience of my students who were gamers and they wouldn't engage in any way. So I came up with a, a by master of a designing game and I used uh, play to learn at the time, uh, play test material and stuff. And, you know, it was amazing. So, um, yeah, it's just like you said, it's a great opportunity, right? So much can be done yeah, through the games, but it's still someone needs to create that atmosphere, you know? All right, I'm going to uh, end Rose's talk there. Uh, we, we're on a, a. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rose, for introducing what LLP means to you. It's it's wonderful to see. Thank you. Um, moving on. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> moving on, we have uh, the LLPX Zero Two Coacher, um, Anton uh, Vegel, aka Junk Runner. Uh, do you want me to do the same thing? Share my screen? Leave it as it is? Or... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Go uh, for it. Hear me. I'm hoping my internet is okay today, uh, but it can be a little spotty. So uh, just call me up uh, if you need me to repeat something. So uh, thanks, James, for putting this together. And thanks, Rose, for introducing it first. Uh, I, as I said, I really like the, the magic in the game comment. Um, so where I found out about LLP, I guess, goes back pretty far in my master's degree, um, reading James Paul Gee and coming across some of Jonathan DeHaan's papers. <clears throat> and in Japan, I met James at a TBLT conference. He came to my presentation uh, and asked some nice questions. And we ended up sitting together for the whole conference and chatting, uh, and we kept in touch. Uh, finally, James got he had enough of all my questions <laughs> and he said jesus just join the discord man <laughs> finally i did and you know it's a great community uh, i'm really happy uh, i listened to you i have a lot of resources than uh, i'll be able to read this year for sure um, but more than that a lot of new ideas a lot of people to kind of bounce those ideas off of so an invaluable community here, I think, <clears throat> even if we don't always agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, my influences, I would say, so my L, L, and P influence, just from starting to kind of jump into the community, it really reframed my understanding of play, fun, and games, especially in terms of education. Um, I didn't really see why those things needed to be put into education or what their value could be uh, if tried to fit in uh, to a classroom, for example. <clears throat> and I, I guess I'll talk a bit more about that later, but also in my other presentation. Um, it illuminated compelling alternative approaches to education. I have observed alternative schools and a bit about it. Um, I've always taught in universities, so we don't really have highly standardized ways of teaching, but it brought a lot of different ideas. Instead of this kind of conveyor belt system or teaching uh, 40 students in a class, um, playing with games and kind of mentoring students with games, it's more touching on kind of apprenticeship idea or even really old, like uh, Indian Lopi, like this pitching in and helping out or learning by pitching in and helping out. And games kind of, they have this inherent system with that 
works. And it, it's pretty fascinating for me that um, games kind of offer a solution for that. Uh, Guy proposed, finally, of all his ideas, um, he kind of really made this simple way to how maybe we could approach education, and that's making learning that's situated, embodied, problem-focused, well-designed, and well-mentored. TBLT, I think, fits in with that well, but especially games. I mean, they are systems that we can interact with, and I think that's why they hold a lot of potential. Um, my pedagogical influences, so from my experience, Kind of what I've tried to do in my classes, <clears throat> I've taken a, kind of a small card small talk game and kind of tried to, to develop that and did a lot of play test that. And even taking a play testing idea has been kind of new um, instead of just sort of keeping it to myself or presenting it once in a while, um, much more workshop style, collaborative style with other people, and iterative design. Just keep making changes until it's uh, I remember I came across question dice, these little dice that had questions on them. And I think before really being pushed into this community, I, I would have let them go and picked them up. But I picked them up and talked to my coworkers at the university about it. And we saw, you know, all these, these different things we could do with the dice and we could use this dice. And it's just such a small point that I value and that I, I thought it would be a fine thing to put. <clears throat> And the last one is designing and implementing strategic interaction. Um, strategic interaction will be a presentation, so I won't get into it too much, but it's basically designing kind of role play scenarios, but the scenarios are really specific. You're, you're designing patients where the students play around in. And I've had a lot of with that, um, and especially thinking of play, it's not just having fun but as designing playgrounds of limitations. So limitations is a key point. Um, so some of my personal takeaways, game design can influence our of interaction. <clears throat> They're good games, as Guy always says, good games are really well-designed systems. Um, game mechanics for language games, uh, for example, randomization, limitations, constrained choice, and some ways I've done it dice, the cards, the scenarios. Um, limitations don't simply limit choice, but they frame, they can frame interaction, right? Without, we often think of limitations as kind of a dirty word, like don't limit your students, give them freedom. Well, too much freedom, what are they going to do with that, mm -hmm. right? Well-designed limitations are another thing. And last, um, play, fun, and games don't have to be dirty words. Um, I know with some uh, talk on the on Discord recently about some recent presentations. I know I sent James a little info at my university, some presentations that games kind of get a bad rap. Um, people don't really think they're serious. And they think if you're putting games, if you're thinking about play and education, uh, you're lazy, uh, you're not being serious as a teacher, but in fact, that can be the exact opposite. Um, so how is LLP different from other fields for me? I see the ludic point, actually. A ludic is a meaningful part of the learning process with LLP. And uh, LLP is also praxis-focused, but theory-informed. So just like Rose was saying, it, it, I'm doing it. And so I kind of think about the two big gaps that I see um, in, L, uh, in the kind of games and education field. On one side, just writing about it, saying, you know, you guys should be doing it. I don't do it, but you know, <laughs> I write about it. And then, you know, on the other side, actually doing it and, you know, and uh, especially um, Jonathan's recent paper, the, uh, the vaporware paper, showing that a lot of these, this research is not done actually in the classroom. Uh, it's kind of in related cases. So doing it. And then the other gap is it's kind of game inspired. I can, I can learn games and influence my pedagogy. But then the other side is using games, designing games, uh, using off the shelf games. Um, James is you know the master of that stuff. And we'll hear about that later. So any questions, I guess, if you guys have anything? Um, can you talk a little about going from writing and thinking about it to uh, implementing it in the classroom and how that worked for you? Yeah. Um, 
I remember in the 2018 conference, uh, one lady said, so what of these games do you use in your class? I really, my strong opinion was, these are institutional limitations that I, I, don't, I don't know if I can break. Um, but since then, uh, I mean, every little thing, especially the card game, the scenarios, um, in my presentation, I'll be talking about how I implemented strategic interaction into my, into a coordinated program in my university. And again, I thought that would be something that there's no room for. They're not going to let me do it. Um, but I kind of, once I was able to do that, I put the three steps, uh, you introduce it. So I presented it. I showed value in it. I was doing it kind of on the side in workshops to make sure I understood that it could work. Um, and then I collaborated that resonated with some other people in my program. And they said, wow, I see the value of this. Um, can we work on this together? So we collaborated and then finally we disseminated. We, we wrote scenarios for units in, you know, the coordinated program. Book. Um, we tested them out and we shared them with everyone. I think those three steps, I mean, it, it took a while. And I think last year I was presenting about it. And finally, this semester, we're implementing it a little bit uh, with kind of the blessing of the department head. So following those three steps maybe worked for me. <laughs> Thank you.